So let's uh, let's pick up pick up where we left off last week. I, I'm sure we covered uh, the the quick point about uh, when to use statistical models or or uh, conventional machine learning methods and 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 when to approach the the deep learning techniques. So, um, Sorry, I interrupt you again. Sorry okay. about that. Can, can you put that bigger? If you yes. go to the A, uh, A on top, the, that should fix the, uh, that for the next slide as well. Okay, okay. thanks. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll work with this. Okay, all right, so in the next slide. Um, the, the next important topic is the, the actual guts of fitting the neural network so uh, recall we we have a data set we have an architecture with these layers and activation functions and um, we have a means of feeding data in one side and getting predictions up the other side um, but the the actual fitting to derive the the coefficients and the biases um, is uh, uh, a computationally intensive challenge. And it's, it's even more uh, uh, challenging because the, the minimum loss or the minimum error rate or the, 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 the minimum mean squared error, depending on, on what you're optimizing for, um, the, the problem space with, with this kind of uh, very complex architecture is non-convex. It, it, it does not have a single local minimum for error. And so there's a conversation in this chapter, this section 10.7, about uh, some adaptations in the algorithms to um, move from, say, the, the initial prediction, uh, which is often even just set by, by random settings of the coefficients, and, and narrow down that, that problem space to, to move across the, this, say, surface to, to find a, a suitable minimum and to do it efficiently. Uh, sorry, Jim, did, did you make the, 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 the GIF? After, yeah. No, no, it's I, I stole the GIF. It's it's out on the internet somewhere. It's it's easy to put GIFs in the in the book down. Um, okay, so the book talks about two strategies, and and incidentally, the the the, the strategies for efficiently finding the the global minimum also help to protect from overfitting. Um, so the, the first group of strategies they talk about is uh, slow learning. And, and the second group of strategies are regularization. Um, okay, so under slow learning, um, the, the steps taken across the solution surface um, follow gradient descent. So uh, an initial, oh, in fact, We'll start with uh, in, in slow learning. Uh, gradient descent conceptually is um, starting with a guess for all the parameters, you know, wherever you are in the problem space. And, and the initial guess doesn't matter a lot, uh, but then finding the direction to move the parameters. So it's essentially taking the partial derivative at, at every single node and uh, to, to say for that coefficient, uh, what direction and how quickly does that parameter have to change so as to decrease the loss function? So the, 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 the gradient, in other words, the, the multidimensional slope evaluated at that current value is a vector of partial derivatives at, at those points. And those gradient values are used in a technique called backpropagation across the architecture um, using, the, using the chain rule um, for differentiation through the uh, uh, backwards through the neural network. 
if you recall chain rule for differentiation, the, this is something we probably all learned um, uh, maybe in Calc 2 back, back in the day. So after computing that vector of derivatives for every, every node, uh, it's evaluated at the current guess. Um, and uh, that gives us, a, say, a direction that, that the new guess needs to come from. Uh, the idea of gradient descent is to move the parameter set a little bit in the in the downhill direction since we wish to go downhill towards the the lower loss and and there's this parameter called learning rate it it essentially says how big a step in the direction of that gradient are we going to take um, some training methodologies have a a single number for a learning rate like 0.1 and and so the step size you know times the gradient is the same but but there exist some training algorithms or techniques that that start with a larger learning rate and then as the epics proceed the learning rate gets smaller and smaller uh, ultimately it, it it means as the loss function approaches the the minimum it can make a smaller and smaller step. <laughs> if the gradient vector hits zero, uh, then you've arrived at the minimum. So there's also a idea here of a stopping function where your loss is no longer improving. The gradients of, of the individual co coefficients are essentially flat and you've arrived and you no longer need to continue running the, the, uh, the, the, the training algorithm. So gradient descent is, and, and slow learning is, uh, is, is concept one. The second concept, we've talked about some before, um, regularization is a, almost always called a penalty or a penalty term. Um, that's imposed on the parameters, um, especially a ridge penalty in, in here, um, because gradient descent usually, usually takes a lot of steps. There, there are ways for um, accelerating the steps. Um, they talk in here about taking a, a, a small fraction of the, see the data or batches and um, so going batch by batch through the training set instead of using the whole training set uh, means uh, in fact they call this stochastic gradient descent where we're breaking up the training set into say smaller training sets randomly and and sending them through the neural network um, each time the mini batch runs through the neural network uh, they, they call this an epic, or a, a, which which is an iteration of a portion of the training set of n samples out of the total processing through. Uh, another technique, um, well, like regularization, uh, to to achieve the same thing as regularization. Um, there are techniques where a certain number of the nodes drop out. Uh, and, and it's inspired by random forests where a, a usually small proportion of the nodes in gray, you know, a dropout percentage is set by a hyperparameter. And, and those nodes are selected as random and ignored for an epic, an instance of training. Um, now that's not through the whole training time period, it's ignored in one epoch and then a, say a different set of dropout nodes are ignored in the next pass. Um, the surviving units stand in for those missing. So in other words, the, the coefficients of the colored nodes end up carrying higher weights because the dropout nodes aren't included. Um, so that prevents nodes from becoming over-specialized or in, in, in effect, over-training. So dropout 
is also a form of, say, regularization and, and avoiding overfitting. So um, com combining all of those things, the, 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 uh, 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 the penalty terms, the learning rate, um, the dropout rate, um, and, and, and the use of the batch size and epics um, all work as a, as a network or in concert with one another to, to uh, uh, build a model that, uh, uh, you know, every one of these hyperparameters has an effect on the performance of the training of the model. Okay, and I do like the GIF. That's, that's so um, in the next section, the authors um, step back again and again, they talk about this bias variance trade-off, um, which, which we've <laughs> covered, it seems in every chapter. And, um, and what they're talking about recall is, is that Training set error may get better and better, but the test set error on, you know, error as measured on a holdout set uh, at some point starts to get worse and worse. And, and the, the best match is often in terms of some intermediate level of model complexity is, is what we referred to in before. And, and recall we had plotted things like flexibility and an error rate on the y-axis and, and seen a, often a U-shape. In fact, the, the U-shape is in this graphic here. Um, but the authors note that with some deep learning situations, it can be possible for uh, a, a neural network uh, to, uh, you know, when, you continue to train on, on something huge like ResNet, um, that, that there's a resumption in the, in the descent of the, of the, say the error beyond the, beyond the U. There are more complex shapes. So it's, it's, it's mathematically possible to have this double descent um, in the, in the bias variance trade-off. And, and the authors say that it still makes sense. They've not given up on their concept of the bias variance trade-off. Uh, what they're saying is, is when we fit a neural network with such a huge number of parameters, um, we're, we're, we're sometimes able to get um, Good results, even with zero training error. There's, there's, there are ways with the regularization and the penalization to to resume this um, path as as the model gets bigger and bigger. Um, they're careful to note, though, that those are in specific problems with a high signal to noise ratio, where, uh, like in images or an audio where at, at, at some point there's still more useful detail to get out of the images uh, or language translation. They, they observed this in, in, uh, 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 in human speech. Um, that's because the techniques used to fit neural networks, including stochastic gradient descent, lend themselves to selecting and, and what they're saying is a smooth interpolating model that has good test set performance on, on these kinds of problems. I, I think when they say interpolating, I, I, I interpret that also as meaning uh, lots of interactions between the features. So they say the double descent phenomenon does not contradict the bias variance trade-off. Uh, most statistical learning methods in, in this book don't exhibit double descent, uh, but, but in these couple of situations like image recognition, language 
and maybe a few others. Um, um, the, the, they do acknowledge that the machine learning community has explained that uh, very deep, uh, heavily parameterized neural networks with many layers, many hidden units can be run all the way to zero training error and, and still often have uh, uh, reasonable test set errors as well. I'll pause there. So double descent is super complicated. Did, did I cover that well, Ricardo and Federica? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, for, for neural networks, it is possible. You know, to get that kind of uh, that kind of minimization uh, in the, in the error, because remember that you're looking for uh, a, a lot of pat patterns, yeah. okay? Um, because you know, an image an image it has a finite uh, composition, okay? In terms of the pixels, for example, you have x amount of you know of, of pixels, and they have uh, you know the their shading. Okay, their you know their their number that is defined also. So with uh, enough parametrization, enough parameters, you can get very close to what that image is. Okay, Be because of that finite composition. Uh, in terms of other other data, for example, uh, tabular data that we are you know all, all you know <laughs> aware of it. Uh, usually, there are a lot of contradictions. If you have you know, a, a lot of a lot of dimensions, right? A lot, a lot of features. You have contradictions that some are going against the target, some are going toward the target. So that creates a lot of noise, right? And that's why in the tabular, you usually the the, the neural networks don't do you know very well, okay? Because that no that noise cannot be filtered, cannot be understood, okay? Because it's based on on random or random or, or occurrences. But for example, for image, for language, in language, you have a pattern in, in the language or, already. So the neural, neural network can discern which is the pattern and get to a precise you know, uh, probability of, let's say, predicting what you are trying to say. I don't know if you have seen, if, if you, you use Gmail, for example, in Gmail, sometimes you have, you start you know, a, a word and kinds of, completes that word, you know, there's a shadow that completes that word because the context is already ingrained in that, in, in that model. Okay, so that, that they, are, they are already predicting what you are trying to say because of the, of the sequence that you are, you know, that, 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 that you're using. Uh, so yeah, in, in, in terms of, uh, and, and it's important that word, uh, high, high uh, noise, uh, high signal to noise ratio, Okay, when you have, you know, a, a lot of good information and reduced noise in that in that sense, uh, deep learning really, you know, does, does a good does a good job. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to add just something that you can think about a gradient descent a descent as uh, calculating the distances within uh, the values. So you're calculating the distances, and then you uh, uh, consider. I see, the I see slope. it more. I see it more, Federica, as a curve. Okay. Yeah. As a curve, in terms of the 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 the, the error. Okay, the error that you get from your predictions and your actual the, the truth, right? Yeah. What you want to do is try to get to that bottom, to that global minima, where the slope of that you know, of that derivative, the mm -hmm. slope of, of the line that is yeah. going to touch that, 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 that point is going to be zero, okay? Yeah. That's what exactly. you want to yeah. do in the yeah. descent. Exactly, it's uh, just calculating um, the, um, as you said, um, it's, it's um, you, you, your, your, aim, your aim is to uh, reach the bottom side of the curve. That's right. okay. And how you do it is calculating the distances within points. So you do actually uh, x2 minus x1 divided by y2 minus y1. And then you have a sort of slope that you calculate. 
and you go down the exactly but, but the curve the function of the curve what is called the gradient descent is called a cost function okay yeah. uh, and it's based on it's based on the distance between yeah. your target and your prediction yeah. but it's a little bit more it has more to it okay because for example it could be a log loss a function for example it has a logarithm there to smooth it and all that yeah so that's then, what you're then, trying to do yeah, yeah. Then you multiply this distance to a function that you have chosen, which is the most uh, uh, suitable one. So you, you have some choices with the function that you can uh, uh, use as a, um, um, as a base for, as a structure, mm -hmm. underneath structure of the model. So right. even if it's a logarithm or uh, an exponent, um, any other of the the, 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 the function that um, can be used and or you can make it uh, your uh, one of your own and then you mm -hmm. uh, the things that uh, gradient descent does does for any function that you apply with it so the things that it calcul it takes care of the distances and then build up the function so mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a very simple thing, very simple as you said, Jim, at the beginning. It's a very simple thing because you do in mathematics, uh, um, uh, even if in your grad school, uh, it, it it it's always the same thing. But now you are uh, applying to some uh, values that you already have to predict new 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 ones. But it's always the same thing. You calculate the distance between your observed values and your predicted values with probabilities. And then you multiply this for, for a function, which is, which is a structure that you're supposed to be the structure of your model, of your phenomenon, which uh, is uh, represented by your model. And then uh, going down to the function, uh, adding point by point, your observed values, uh, initially without parameters, and then you estimate the parameter with the back propagation. So you're going back to check uh, the values, and then you set the parameters. Uh, in, the, in the chat, I. <laughs> I put a link to a neural uh, ne network uh, network course, okay, that I found very very interesting in, in YouTube. Uh, in the first ten minutes, it explains everything from the hidden layers, for propagation, power propagation, and power propagation really is the feedback that you get when you are correct in your prediction. If you, if, for example, if, you, if it's a mini image, for example, uh, they give you an example of an image of a square, a circle, and a triangle. And you want to process that so that new data, when new data comes, you can predict if, if the output, the output is a circle, a square, or a triangle. If you get a miss in that prediction, then it goes back to the model, okay? That's the backward propagation. It goes back to, it's like a feedback loop, goes back to the model, and then the, the hidden layers try to adjust to try to minimize that uh, classification error, okay? So if you can watch, you know, the, the video is about two hours long, but if you can watch those, those 10, 10 minutes of that example, you will learn a lot about what is those terms, you know, are, are you know, are, are defined, okay? And remember, neural networks, what I'm trying to mimic is how the human brain uh, works, okay? And human, the humans work by association, in other words. Okay, we work by association, we relate things, mm -hmm. and that's how we acquire, uh, you know, understanding. Okay, so that, that's what the neural world was trying to mimic, something that is not present in those traditional, you know, random forests, HD booths, all that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll make sure the comment is in the notes. Um, I, I had, yep. uh, I, I thought uh, uh, Josh Starmer at StatQuest did a fantastic job and John Crone has a has a deep learning illustrated book with some fantastic illustrations too that, mm -hmm. that we won't have time to get into. Like you said, it's 
it's another two hours by itself, but the visuals, right, right. I, I don't know which video this is, but there, there are other courses that are outstanding. Uh, at least those 10 minutes, you know, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but those 10 minutes explains that example. And it explains a lot about, you know, how the neural networks, you know, do their, you know, how, how they work. Okay, which usually is a mystery. <laughs> okay, all right. So we're about, let's say, halfway through the time here. I did want to get to exercises and the uh, uh, well the say the the uh, in in the textbook resources there are uh, examples worked through with the uh, tensorflow um, tool layer called Keras Keras abstracts away a lot of the math and makes it pretty easy to build an architecture. And in Torch, as I understand it, um, LUS is uh, at least the R package that's coming together that also abstracts away some of the complexity. Um, so I'll, I'll scroll through the exercises I have, but we'll step over to the author's supplementary materials. Um, I, I'd run the ones in Torch. I guess I understand them better if, if you don't mind. Um, we, we could come back though and, and look at the same things in Keras. So conceptually in, in ex exercises, the first, first couple points have to do with the single layer neural network where we open the chapter and they're saying, um, consider a, a uh, hypothetical neural network just with two hidden layers. It's, it's got four input nodes two units in the second layer, or two units in the first hidden layer, three in the second, and a single output. It says draw a picture. So I drew a picture. And then write out an expression for f of x, assuming Rayla activation functions. And they say be as explicit as you can. So um, this notation is, uh, is just awesome. I. Uh, if, if uh, uh, the, the function is the sum of the, here's the activation functions for, for nodes one through K through the first layer, and then each subsequent layer, so AK will be this layer, AL would be the second layer, and, and we have to chain this stuff together. So, um, Looks like it cut off my uh, uh, graphic. There's there's more out to the right, and then the ReLU function, the activation function at each node, is is this, where g of z is is z, un unless z is less than one. So the complete equation. Uh, my goodness. Okay, what I had in R was was it's like. 18 inches long and it's cut it off here in the book. <laughs> said, yikes. Uh, and then they said, plug in values for the coefficients and write up the value of f, and f, f, f of x. Um, for this neural network, I ended up with 23 parameters, which more or less corresponds to the um, a coefficient for every line and a bias for every layer. Oh, here it is, in fact. Um, what else is here? Oh, this is all right. So when we're done, I'll 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 paste in our cohort to second video and our chat log. But let's step over to the the uh, back in the in the textbook resources this should look familiar uh, over in resources in the second edition um, you can go to our, our markdown files and for chapter 10 um, you can walk through the lab as uh, a Keras or tensorflow html file or or in fact you can run the r markdown yourselves or 
Um, you can do the same thing in Torch and we'll take a look at the Torch version. Is, is that okay? I don't wanna lose, you, you we're on the same page? Okay, yeah. all right, I, I see head nods. Good, good. Um, so many directions. So um, this is uh, 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 Daniel Falbell and Sigrid Kedana of our studio that are working on the ML verse and the um, say the torch extensions for R uh, built this page. Um, this was not me. And they provided it to the authors of the text who added it to their resources. Uh, but um, the R package that's like Keras that sits on top of Torch is called Luz, L-U-Z. And um, it does not require a Python or a reticulate installation. This can be run directly in R. Um, so in the lab, the first example is, again, the single layer network, and they're looking at the hitters database. Um, so they're predicting salary, a number. And, and in the first case, they're, they're using just a linear model. Uh, should be familiar, but, but to go through the effort here and the, the prediction for um, Well, okay, the mean of the absolute value of the prediction minus salary, this is, this is essentially the error, is uh, 254. Um, they can run the, the, the same regression instead of with a straight linear model with a, uh, with GlimNet, with a um, 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 regularized regression, and, and cross-validation, CV deglimnet. The cross-validation helps uh, assess the, the penalty for, for uh, dropping out certain coefficients and the, the, the ratio between ridge and lasso re regression. And, and using glimnet, they can improve this um, error rate from 254 to 252, and this is all using conventional, uh, uh, say, ma machine learning or, or uh, a conventional modeling. Um, but at this point, they, they take the break to, to build a neural network. Um, in this case, a single layer neural network, they load Torch, LUS, and Torch Vision has some nice data sets and, and, and bits for convolutional neural network Im image transformation. Um, so they build a, um, a neural net module um, with a, uh, a, a linear layer, um, ReLU activation, uh, a portion of dropout, and, and then an output. And then, um, and, and this is a single layer neural network. Uh, <laughs> this inside the function then, it, it all works with pipes, which is kind of convenient. And they come up with a, uh, actually a model matrix to serve to TensorFlow. Um, so when this is set up, this mod and n. Uh, uh, sorry, Jim, here is a, a different data set. This is jitter. Oh, jitters, yes, yes. What they did is they removed, they removed the uh, NAs. So the hitters that do not have a salary are removed. So hitters became jitters. So the, uh, the same data set, but they have uh, uh, a quite different thought because we then have this uh, mean square error before. Uh, with the cross validation, you have uh, still like. Uh, we'll, little, we'll, get, uh, we'll get to the. Uh, so they, they all use jitters. Higher. 
yeah, okay. lower, yeah, low, well, lower value because uh, it's 252. Um, so from 254, they went down to 252. And then yes. with Torch, they, they, they reach 400 or something like that. Is that? In, in fact, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a single layer neural network may not always perform as well as something as simple as, simple as regular regression. That happens. But recall, this is, it only has the one hidden layer. So it, the neural network isn't always better. Um, the other thing, uh, he arbitrarily chose uh, 0.4 dropout, 40% dropout. Um, it's, it's, it's a single layer of um, um, that's 50 nodes. I don't know what the, I should have said what the dimensions of this uh, were, were like, but the, so that the architecture of this clearly isn't sufficient to say arrive at an optimal um, um, salary number. Uh, it's just illustrative of, of uh, you know, a first pass at building a, a neural network with the architecture above, you know, set up for mean squared error loss. Um, and in fact, they only go 20 epics. Um, I don't know, it, it, it looks to me like the, the loss is flattening out. Um, but yeah, clearly the um, the um, Glimnet beat the single layer neural network. Okay, then they, um, in the lab, step it up a little bit, we go to the handwriting data, um, MNIST, and um, in fact, that torch vision includes the MNIST data sets. Uh, Which, Jim, yes, I, I, ju I just take the dimension of, of jitters, you yeah. know, taking out the DNAs, the and it's 263 rows by 20. That's a pretty small data set, definitely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, you, usually for, for neural networks, you need a lot more data, <laughs> yeah, you know, to, to get, a, to get a, a, a good, you know, a, a, a good model, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, so, but, but this is just example, you know, this is yeah. just, you know, example on how, you know, you should approach, you know, this. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So for a small data set too, yeah. uh, not a surprise that the single layer neural net didn't, um, what was not optimal, didn't realize the, the and also potential. One, one thing also that you have to balance, you know, usually, you know, if you have a lot of models, okay, including deep learning, uh, you want to assess, you know, how accurate uh, those models are, you know, for, for the goal that, that you are trying to achieve. But also you have to take account the execution time, okay? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and when you go to production, that's going to be vital. Because, for example, in deep learning, you spend a lot of resources, okay? You know, just arriving to a single, you know, to a single pr prediction. You know, uh, think about images, think about text, uh, uh, natural language processing. So sometimes you have to balance that, you know, should I, you know, sacrifice a little bit of accuracy, you know, in my model for a better performance, okay? You know, less layers, you know, hidden layers, because every time you add a hidden layer, you know, you're adding complexity, okay? And you're adding more, you know, you need more resources. So that's one of the things that you have to also balance, not only the accuracy in terms of the bias and variance, but also the performance, okay? And usually the performance, you know, for XGBoost, for example, gradient boost, a random forest is a little bit faster than, you know, compared to a, to a deep learning model. Yeah. So that's something that also you have to, you know, put in your, you know, in, 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 in your basket of decision making there. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't mention it here. He uh, picks an optimizer. And so the, say the, say the learning rate 
is uh, is, is 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 sliding as it goes through the epics, but um, th there exist cases too where um, the the error rate bounces around because the learning rate's too high, and um, yeah, you you could consume a lot of time like you said, and resources on a neural net and never achieve the performance that you can get, um, especially with a small data set. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to the images though, where we would expect um, that uh, convolutional neural net will, will shine. Uh, we can load that from Torch Vision. Um, can see that uh, the, 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 the training set is, is uh, 60,000 handwritten images and the holdout test set is 10,000 labeled images. In this case, they're all 28 by 28 pixels and they're in grayscale. So every one of those pixels has a, a, a value from zero to 255 uh, representing how, you know, everything from white to black. Um, some uh, transformations are done to the data initially. Um, essentially to, to get that uh, shape, the 28 by 28 image um, at, at this grayscale into a, a data structure called a, a tensor. And uh, there's some convenience functions in uh, torch vision that uh, make packaging images as as tensors very easy. Um, so they they create this transform function, um, and then um, for the MNIST data set, uh, run that transform operation across every image. Same with the test data set, and then uh, prepare to fit the neural network. As with the single layer one, um, they set up um, an initialization function. Uh, in this case, three layers. And it's nice that, that you can see the in features. So that's the, say the size of the image and out features is what goes to the next layer. So 256 goes to 256 and 128 goes to 128. And then we're predicting, recall, this is 10 handwritten digits from zero to nine. Uh, they specify some dropout with each, each layer and then the forwarding function that, that defines how the data moves through the uh, architecture. So there's uh, linear coefficients, there's activation function, ReLU in this case, and the dropout. So you can print the model. I, I like this, how it, it, when you say print, it tells you what you just built even before you trained it and the number of parameters. So the LUS does the math for you and tells you, um, you know, how, how big is this neural net architecture that you've created. Um, Okay, so as before, as we did before, so we got the model, then we, we run through the setup, we define the loss function. Uh, recall, because this is not a binary problem, this is a say, category with nine categories, the right loss function is a cross entropy instead of a, a, you know, a log loss. Um, they're using the same optimizer to, to scale the learning rate and um, all right, so with, with that set up in place, they run the model through, through the fit, just like any other machine learning. Uh, this time they're saying five epics. It takes more time to go through all those images and, and, and load them and push them through. And after 131 minutes, in their case, they, they plot, um, the improvement in accuracy for each epoch or the, the reduction in loss for each epoch. And 
you can see on the training set, the, the reduction in loss is not, not improving much each, each time, certainly not improving on the, the validation set. Um, it's interesting in their text. Oh, they say 215 seconds. I don't see 215 seconds. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the time they said here and the time that shows up above. Uh, Jim, you run this in your machine? Separately, yeah. No, well, Separately? So, okay. so, so the page I pulled here is straight out of the text. So, um, okay. Yes, I ran it on my machine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd have to go back and look at the times. Okay. Um, but is your machine, you know, I have more cores, more RAM? Uh, I, I have 16 gig of RAM, but um, I'm pretty sure I have 12. Well, well I, I've got, I'm set up with the GPU. Okay. That so, makes if if it is using it, the GPU does make a whole lot of difference. Yeah, I've got I've got here. I've got CUDA set up so Torch uses the GPU. So okay, yeah, yeah, and, and and that's that's dependent then on your own configurations, what what you end up with. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, that, that makes that, that that makes that makes a dent, you know, in that in that time. <laughs> yeah. So for the MNIST. Uh, set for the for the neural network that they set up. They 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 create their own accuracy function instead of using uh, yardstick, and they come up with a, uh, a a misclassification accuracy or classification accuracy for the ten digits at at point nine four. Um, they do know that you could put this through GlimNet. It will handle multi-class logistic regression, but it's 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 going to be very slow on these twenty by eight by twenty-eight images. Um, uh, but but they do compare this accuracy, this 0.94 that they got with the hidden layers, to a a a neural net with just one layer, which. Uh, as a thought exercise, you could think of a one layer neural network as a linear model. Um, I think 28 by 28 is. Um, well, so, to, so basically, this uh, neural network uh, uh, module is made of initialize and forward. That's right. So this initialize is require that does does a, a require a function. So you need to build up a function for this initialize argument. Did you? Yeah, in in, you in, it? in in every case, this is a little bit like a cookbook where okay. Yes, yes, in every case. So, and then module includes yeah. both an initialize mm. element and a forward element. Um, and then module is a is a it, and all of this stuff is written with R six objects, um, so they look a little bit different than other R um, uh, data objects. Um, yeah, what, what you're doing here is just configuring your your model spec, right? Yeah. You know, yes. Your model spec. So then you're going to use this, you know, to fit the model. Right. So first we have to build the architecture. Right. And then when you have the architecture, then you 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 set up the so parameters for running that architecture with mm -hmm. you know your loss function, your optimizer, and your your list of metrics. metrics. Yep. And then uh, in, in their case, they go straight from setup to, uh, you know, with, yeah, the sing, with the single the layer, they do the fit mm -hmm. and they, they get with a, with a single layer of coefficients, uh, so like a linear model, they get 91% mm -hmm. accuracy 
Um, and, and that's on the training set. They also can look at that model on a test set <laughs> and, and they get 91% on the test set. So they get 91% accuracy on one layer. They get 94% accuracy on the on, on the yes model. on the on the three layer model this right. one input 256 and 128 so they picked up about three percent improvement in accuracy for the additional hidden layer right and that is just reading the pixels literally um, in the next step um, they're going to apply a transformation um, well. And, and this exercise is a little bit like the MNIST, but you could apply the same transformations, the convolutions to MNIST. Um, MNIST isn't so interesting though, because it doesn't, I mean, the images are just handwriting. So they switch over to CIFAR, also in Torch Vision. And, and, and in this case, we're gonna apply some of those convolutions. Um, Recall convolutions include actually this diff. So uh, we are going to define this uh, box that will sweep across the image and apply a function to the, the group of points in that image and the convolved feature or the, the subsequent layer is a combination of the, the elements in the prior image. And uh, okay, so they read in the data sets. Um, the, the training side of this is 50,000 images. There's some of them below. Um, each of them is essentially a three-dimensional tensor in this case because they are color. So they're 32 by 32, uh, eight-bit pixels, but in three color layers. And uh, the convolutional neural network here that they built then uh, same NN module, same initialize. We're going to build a, a first a convolution layer. Um, this is a this is a three by three square, um, and then a ReLU uh, layer, uh, um, so a hidden layer, and then max pooling like we described it before. And then the forward function, so the initialized function and the forward function. Um, convolution block. Okay, they, they built two different versions here. There's this convolution block and then there's model. Oh, I see. So they, they build the convolution block to use it in here. So they use it several times. Uh, quite complex, I think. Yeah, this, this three by three thing illustrated here, they, they use it uh, in, in a sequential, <laughs> neural network so layer after layer they they uh, do it one two three four times this time inside the initialize uh, function you don't don't set anything you just uh, recall the the convolution block and then yeah. then you do with different parameters. Wow. So the, the model reads as just a staggering number of parameters. 
uh, oh no, the, the, can you can you just scroll a bit up? The, there is this no no not too much um, in the in the module uh, in the model module here and then there is the second part of the initialize function which is the sequential again and then here they said the dropout and the mm -hmm. relu and the, the things. Okay, so they uh, here again with the label data, they've got um, lots and lots of labels on these images. They, they use cross entropy as a loss, the same optimizer for the learning rate. Um, they'll do 10 epochs of the training, holding 20% uh, of that training data as, as validation. And they'll run 128 images at a time. And they run this guy for 20 minutes. And then they run that evaluation function uh, written up above. And they, uh, they get an accuracy of 35%, which sounds terrible. But actually, it's great when you've got uh, so many categories. Yeah, It takes 10 minutes and gets 36% accuracy on the test data. But, but for 100 classes, that's a pretty good start. And, the, they, and he says that a random classifier gets 1% one, 1 accuracy. That's your baseline. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you, 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 usually for multi class, you know, uh, the models, the accuracy uh, takes a hit for multi class uh, models. And, and we have 100. I mean, they're going to have mixed classifications. No way. <laughs> So we're, we're going to run out of time here, but the, the last section here is, uh, is an interesting exercise in mm -hmm. uh, pulling the ImageNet, um, call it a, a database or pre-trained model, and then taking six of your own images, so, so just six, and training another layer so so bolting on your own training layer on top of ImageNet to to classify additional images so um this 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 in fact you can oh, okay that link doesn't work um you, you can go grab your own images and label them um but they, they have this model ResNet that's pre-trained. Um, it has 18 layers and a lot of complexity, and it, but it's already been trained up. So you can download mm -hmm. that ResNet 18 and you can classify your own six images. And well, in fact, they've got an image called Flamingo and after training uh, the last layer, they get these prob class probabilities for uh, their flamingo, their hawk, you know, a cropped image, a hawk generally, a and a cat, <laughs> you know, and, and even like their cat image comes out being classified most likely as a St. Bernard, that's probably a problem. Um, but anyway, this, this exercise of bringing additional images and appending that to a, a prior trained model is a is very useful exercise and gives you some sense of how far you can take convolutional neural nets, uh, particularly ones that are you know, already trained and, and you can add to them. They, they also do the same thing with, uh, with an IMDB a movie document classification challenge where they um, you know, ascertain uh, some things about movies. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're essentially out of time, but this exercise is, is a lot of fun on your own computer. Assuming you're, you've got uh, pretty good hardware, um, you can uh, have some fun with, with uh, uh, doing this last step on a convolutional neural network. Um, so, 
So we're out of time. What what should we do next week? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna Good stop job, sharing. Jim. Thank you. Uh, stop, Thank you very stop much. Share. Yeah, what's up next week? I think we're starting with the survival, chapter eleven, right? That would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I'm that, going to that, be in I'm going to be flying to Puerto Rico. So I'll let you notice because I have to do uh -huh. a, a couple of things. But probably uh -huh. Thursday I should be I should be available. Okay. Okay. If, will, if you, I will, I will tell if you, you want to, if you want to jump the week, the the this the, the next week and do the, the following, just let us know that that will be fine. Yeah. We can I, I, I'll let you know at least uh, Tuesday I'll have a, a, a better Keep. feeling of how the week yeah. is you know is evolving. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. Thank okay. you. Great talk. Bye. Bye-bye.